Pretty cool. 38 salvations. Let's give the Lord praise together. Awesome. Fantastic. Amen. We just congratulate Pastor John and all those that worked as volunteers and parents. God bless you for uh, com together combining for God's work in a child's life. You can't beat doing something good for a child. Amen. So we love kids here, love teens, love everybody. And today we're going to continue our, our message series on move. And we had talked about last week that we are to move with the Spirit and move from faith to faith, glory to glory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But today is more about uh, the warfare that we face in trying to do that. That is, the enemy moves against us so that we will not move forward in our faith. But God is greater, and God is going to give us the victory. We're going to look at Psalm 62 and verse 6. In the Psalms, 14 times you'll find this phrase. 14 times it's a theme. I shall not be moved. Because David, even though he was a worshiper, even though he was a king, a warrior, guess what? David had enemies, and David had struggles. And so David many times had to do the same thing you and I do, and we have to say, no, I'm not going to be moved by this circumstance coming against me. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right. So again, Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that you will make this meaningful, that you will intersect us in our thoughts. You would plant the word in our heart. It will not return void. We pray you'd anoint the preacher and the parishioner alike, that you touch, touch us together, that we sit together with you in heavenly places. Lord, bind every distraction and uh, every hard heart, and Lord, open our hearts to you and to your word and your love. We thank you for that in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Well, the Olympics are wrapping up today, and uh, America leads in the medal count. So way to go, USA, right? That's awesome. But what intrigued me was the rewards that certain countries are giving to those that win gold medals at the Olympics. That's right. In fact, if you are going to get really uh, rich, you would need to be from Saudi Arabia that is giving $1.3 million to any gold medalist from their country. That's right. Hong Kong, $763,000. Indonesia, interesting, $363,000 and five cows. How about that? I mean, let's just throw in the cows because, you know, you never know when you might need one. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then you go on to, you know, for our, the Olympic Committee is giving $50,000 to every gold medalist in track and field. U.S. gymnasts get $37,000 if they get a gold medal. And there's some countries that are giving three-bedroom apartments uh, free, uh, signature cars, uh, a lifetime pension, uh, absence from military service. And uh, what I like the best is Malaysia. Malaysia's giving free food for a year to every gold medalist. Come on, somebody, huh? So I'm going to start training after this service, see if I can pick up those five cows in four years. But before the Olympics got started, before they could even get there, there was a terrorist attack on July 26th. This is where they set fires on the speed train rails in France and around Europe. Thousands of athletes and thousands of people could not even get to the opening ceremony because of terrorist activity that delayed them going. Paul knew about this in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 18. He said, I wanted to come to you, but the devil thwarted me. Good old King James means the devil hindered me and kept me from getting there. So it is suffice it to say that the enemy doesn't want to, you to get to the gold because uh, 1 Peter 1, 7 talks about that your faith in the fire is of much greater worth than gold or a gold medal. And so if the enemy can keep you from getting to that faith and getting that gold from God in your life, then he's going to stop you before you ever even have a chance to get going in that area of your life. We have to understand that Satan uh, has a plan to stop your forward movement. We look at how that we cannot answer everybody's individual episode of evil in your life. We do know the worldview of why there is evil and why Satan uses it. We know that God created everything good, right? Remember that, Genesis chapter 1? 
But then we know from Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, that the enemy had what? He had rebelled against God, and he tried and did take a third of the angels with him, and then came into that garden that God had made good with humans God made good, and then as a serpent deceived them both and led them in a terrorist way uh, to lose the paradise God had planned for them. So we understand that evil in the world, first of all, has an origin, and that is not God, that is Satan. We look at that demonic way, we understand that he tried to stop Christ. In fact, in Luke twenty two fifty three, 53, Jesus said, this is the hour before the crucifixion when darkness reigns. He was acknowledging that there is a spiritual battle, the earth is a contested space, and that the enemy is trying not only to take it over, but take you over and take you away from God. Well, demonic evil leads, leads to moral evil. When Adam and Eve sinned, then it brought moral evil, where people had the choice of choosing to do evil, but also having a principle of sin or rebellion to God's law in them. So we have, hence, 500,000 people who have, to date, died in the Ukrainian war. We know also that on October 7, 2023, Hamas killed 1,200 Jews, and since that time, 40,000 people have died in the Gaza war. We know that Romans 124 says that God said he's going to give us over to our own selfish desires. So demonic evil led to moral evil, and then that led to natural evil. God was merciful. He uh, Again, let them live, Adam and Eve, and he also clothed them, made a sacrifice for them, but he didn't let them eat the tree of life because he wanted to have mercy on them that they would not live in eternity without freedom and away from God's presence. But yet he cursed the ground, and when he did curse the ground and the earth, we know that we have natural evil because of demonic evil leading way to moral evil, which resulted in God's judgment upon moral evil and then the earth as well. We look at hurricanes. Since 1851, Florida has had about 1,200 hurricanes, and they've had 500 uh, different, no, I'm sorry, I said 1,200. It's actually uh, not 1,200. That would be a little bit too much. I think it's uh, somewhere uh, beneath that, and my mind is escaping me with that. But Florida's had a lot of hurricanes, suffice to say. 500 tropical storms. In that time, lots of people have lost their life, and lots of it's been 120 hurricanes, I'm sorry. And lots of people have lost damage to their home. We know that tornadoes, there's been over 1,200 tornadoes that have hit the U.S. just this year. You've only heard about the most deadly ones, but where does that come from? Where do tsunamis, earthquakes, where does that come from? The Bible says in Romans 8 and 22 that the whole earth groans until the day of its redemption. That even the earth groans, in Romans 8 and 26, we groan and the spirit groans within us for redemption because we know that we were made for something more than this. And so even the earth groans until there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. But in the meantime, what happens to people who experience the devil's evil? Well, they, many times, if they are not a person of faith, they will turn into atheists or agnostics and withdraw from God. If they are Christians, sometimes they will feel rejection. Like, why did God let me go through this? Why didn't he stop this? And they would feel like there's something wrong with them. And the enemy comes along to accuse you. He accuses me about, yes, there is something wrong with you. And God doesn't love you. And God's not good. And all these things that the enemy throws at us to make us withdraw because rejection leads to rebellion and then rebellion leads to bitterness. Many people, because of the problem of evil, say that they're bitter at God because God let this happen and let that happen. And so they live their lives like Jacob who said what? After Joseph was taken away from him, I am going to go down to the grave in grief. That is that you can't help me. I'm not going to change. I'm just going to live bitter the rest of my life. Yet Jacob didn't realize that God was going to give him one of the greatest blessings when he brought Joseph uh, back into his life. Even in Hollywood, we know from the Batman movie, Lex Luthor is articulating as the villain, he is articulating the problem of evil even out of a Hollywood film. He said, the problem of evil in the world, no man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from my daddy's fist and abominations. 
I figured out way back, if God was, is all-powerful, he cannot be all-good. And if he's all-good, he can't be all-powerful. So it is, we know from our text today, that even believers struggle with the problem of evil. Psalm 62, verse 1, he says, my soul is waiting on you to give me deliverance. In fact, I don't know why uh, you are allowing this to continue in my life. He said, I, I, in verse 3, uh, the enemy is continually attacking me. You're doing nothing. My soul waits in silence. That is that the outward prayer is reflective of an internal battle inside of him about how that he is battling in silence the things of why this evil, why God. But yet in verse 2, he says, I still will not be significantly shaken. Significantly shaken means that we're real. Christians are real. That is that we, we get affected when we lose somebody. We get affected when there's evil. But yet we are not significantly shaken in that we lose our faith and turn away from what we know about God. This is what David is saying because it is faith that is the number one thing that is going to move you forward in your family, your marriage, your parenting, your finances, your mental health, you name it. It's going to be your faith and your belief in what God has planned for you and what he desires to do in your life because weak faith will hinder spiritual growth. Now, again, this is no theologian, but Bart Simpson weighs in on this and begins to question God's power to do something good. And he says, can God even make a burrito so big he can't eat it? I mean, come on. He's trying to basically form the old question of, God, can God make a rock that is so big he can't move it? Can God take a paper clip and, and make a square circle out of it? Well, no, uh, because God made fundamental laws that, again, a square has four points and a circle has no points. And so what God has defined already is how he operates. And what God uh, operated in was a choice that he had. He had a choice to create none of us. He had a choice to create us as robots that, yes, you will love me and you will obey me. Yes, sir, I will because I am a robot. But no, the third choice he had was to create us like him in his image and likeness, which is free free choice, free will, and which is holy and pure and good. And so he chose to do that, but that had a consequence. The consequence was that we could choose something bad, like even Adam did. We could choose evil, and if we did choose that, then God who is good and holy would have to chastise and judge us for that so that we could be corrected with that. And in all that, we see that there's judgment on the world, on moral evil, and it all came from the devil. So God made a choice because the, what he wanted was a relationship. He wanted you and I to truly love him, not be made to love him. He wanted to have a, a bigger family than just the triune Godhead, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. He wanted to have a, a family of God. And so in doing that, he had to create the possibility of choice. And the possibility of choosing brought the possibility of evil. So God operates within those laws. Natural laws cannot be moved that he made. You know, you can't move the conservation of energy, the laws of thermodynamics, the water cycle, the fine tune of the universe, or we would all be dead. If those chains are removable, then we would not be here, folks. But God has set these laws, which are unmovable, into existence, and there are also spiritual laws that cannot be moved. This is what the psalmist comes down to say in verse 6, after all that, I'm waiting, and I am also uh, wondering how long you're going to let this go on. Verse 3, I am waiting again. Verse 5 and verse 6, he says what? Because the Lord is my rock. Now, again, back in those days, uh, mountains and rocks, they were not easily movable. Today, we might blow them up with dynamite, but then um, you couldn't move them. So he's finding something in the landscape of his life and his times that cannot be moved, and he's equating God and his belief and the revelation of who God is into that metaphor, and he's saying that God is my rock that he is my fortress, therefore I shall not be moved by the enemy who's moving against me. And what we see in that is what are some of the rocks 
that cannot be moved. Well, he says in Luke chapter 18, 19, Jesus says there's only one that is good. Only one that is good, and that is God. It's like C.S. Lewis who said he was an atheist, but he said, I found out that when I was an atheist that I thought the world was unjust. But I said, well, how can I, fail? How can I say the world's unjust? Well, there must be a God that made it just. So, so when we look at the fact that there's only one good, how do you know there's evil? Because you judge it by there is good. And who is the one that is only pure good? That is God. Mark it down. He is the purity of perfect goodness. He can never, ever be not good to you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. End of story. So you got to have that as a rock in your faith. That's what Habakkuk 113 says. God doesn't create evil. It's the devil who creates evil. It's moral people who create evil. It's the natural evil. But God doesn't create evil. Because why? James 1.13. God cannot be tempted with evil. That means he can never do you wrong. Hello. He can't be tempted to do you wrong and do you in and to be mean and send you a lightning bolt. He can't be tempted to do evil and neither will he tempt anybody else to do evil. And because because of who he is, he has defined his almighty power to be governed by his almighty attributes, and that is that God is good. Therefore, God cannot sin against you. He cannot mess up against you, right? The Bible says in Hebrews 6 and 18 that God cannot lie to you, that if he told you something, that it has to come to pass. The Bible says that he cannot cease to exist. The Bible says in Malachi 3, 6, he cannot change. He doesn't get up one day and say, I'm having a bad hair day, I'm going to be mad today and moody, and I'm going to strike somebody with lightning. No, God cannot change. He's good all the time, holy all the time, righteous all the time, just all the time, perfect all the time, can't ever fail you all the time. That's why you understand and he cannot break his promise. Come on, somebody, you need to think about this just a second. God is my rock. Why is he my rock? Because I remember in the, my problems of evil that God cannot break his promise to me and that his power cannot be stopped, even with pagan kings like in Daniel 4, 35. And guess what? Jeremiah 31, 3, God cannot stop loving you. Amen. That means there's never a time when God could do something unloving in your life. There's never a time that he could mess up and say, oh, I'm having a bad day. You sinned too much. I'm going to get mad at you. No, God said, I have loved you with an everlasting love and with loving kindness. I will draw you unto myself. I'm going to, in Hosea, I'm going to woo you. I'm going to romance you. I'm going to let you know, Romans 2, for the goodness of God so that you will turn to me and realize I'm not behind the evil. I'm the one that's redeeming you from evil. I'm the one that's providing for your goodness. I'm the one that's giving you every good and perfect gift. And when you realize that, when the trouble times come, you say, I shall not be moved because God and the revelation of God is my rock. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Amen. Woo. It's time to go get that Malaysia free food for a year. Come on. Well, that's faith. You've got to have faith to move you forward. Remember, 31% of people in the congregation are stuck or dissatisfied. You got to have faith to move yourself out of that rut and to move forward. Number two, you got to have hope. Hope is the substance of things that we have faith for. Hebrews 11.1. 1. So hope is that real foundation of your life. We're going to be doing a series of that as we move into September on there is hope because our world is, seems like it's moving in hopeless cycles. But there is a hope. This is C.S. Lewis I mentioned to you before who was an atheist turned to God. And C.S. Lewis, you know, was an atheist that turned to God. And you think, well, that's great. God should give him a bed of roses to live by. I mean, he was an atheist. Now he's serving God. Hey, that a boy. I want to make your life great because you are a good testimony. But no. He had still allowed him to encounter the problem of evil. He married uh, a wonderful poet by the name of Joy, and Joy died from cancer four years after they were married. He wrote The Problem of Evil. And when he wrote The Problem of Evil, this is what he said. 
He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So then the second part of of this, I shall not be moved, is not just having a rock of revelation about who God is and having faith to believe that, but it is when you are in a problem of evil that you have hope that God will work a greater good out of that bad evil. <laughs> Amen. Here we go. You see, Grief many times puts us in solitude. Superman had a place called the Fortress of Solitude. He was a superhero in this cartoon and the movie series, right? He was somebody that was trying to help people who were products of getting evil raged against them. But yet there were times in his life as you follow the cartoon, you follow the movie series that Superman ran into some questions or some evil, some pro people out to get him, uh, problems with kryptonite, all, all kinds of things that made him go back to the fortress of solitude. Many people who have problems of evil in their life drop out. They drop out of church. They drop out of a relationship with God because the evil seems to be too much. But yet when he went there, he went there for a reason to reconnect with his identity. Who was he? Where was he from? And his uh, heritage, his uh, purpose. What was he given this special power from the Krypton sun to, to do good? And he had to regroup. And out of that regrouping, he would always come out of this fortress of solitude stronger or better or more resolute about his purpose and identity in the world. So the question I raise to you, is it possible when we go through times of evil for us to take times of solitude and to really regain at the feet of Jesus and the word of God our identity, our heritage in the saints, our purpose in this world, and then to come out of it stronger than we have been before? And I say yes to that. Even Hollywood sex about Spider-Man. Spider-Man's bitten by a spider, and then he has these powers, and he uses them for himself. He enjoys uh, uh, frolicking along with his uh, webs all over the city and having fun, jumping off of buildings and, and all that until a problem of evil came, and his uncle was the victim of evil in a murder. And in that, in that moment, it's when his uncle talked about that great power comes with great responsibility. And it changed his life to now using what he had for a purpose in order to help others who go through evil. Is it possible that in a time that God who is good allows anything to come our way that maybe he is wanting to reveal a stronger purpose in our life, that our mess can become our message. We can help somebody else after we get through this instead of having a pity party about what, how bad it is, how about thinking about how good it could be if we come through and share with someone else how they can come through. So again, the future hope. What do, does, does the psalmist say? He boils it down in verse 8. Read it for yourself. Psalm 62, verse 8. He, kept, he comes in verse 6 and says, Hey, the Lord is my rock. I will not be moved. Then he says the second part of hope. And he says that I will trust him in all times. Oh, I will trust him in all times. One more time. I will trust him in all times. Oh, there there's the hope he has. There's the victory he has. So what kind of hope should you have? Well, first of all, if it weren't for some pains in our life and trouble, we wouldn't be saved. Some of us wouldn't because we got saved in a time of crisis, right? We got saved because we had some bad things 
going on in our life. We got saved because we had the conviction of our sin and that, hey, John 3, 16, he came to save all those so we wouldn't perish, right? So there's a crisis for you, to perish eternally. Well, that pain brought salvation to many of us, brought us down to an altar where we gave our heart to Jesus. And when we were in that crisis, something good came out of it, namely our salvation. Whether you were a kid in children's church realizing that you need the Savior, or whether you are, were a drug addict or alcoholic who needed, needed deliverance from God, though thanks be unto God, he allowed us to understand the pains of this world are not as bad as the pain of eternal punishment or eternal separation from God. And thank God he loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son that he could deliver us so we would not perish, not only in this life, but in the life to come, but not that only growth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, that we also know that pain causes us to grow. If we never had a problem, Andre Crouch sang, we never know that God could solve them. How many people have, have seen God do great things when you had a problem? You had to go to God, and God answered you. This poor man cried, and the Lord delivered me from all of my fears and trouble. So it is pain that moves us to God, and we grow. It builds character or maturity. Oh, how many of you know that many times we say we think we're going to just tiptoe through the tulips? I don't know if you remember Tiny Tim. That's, that's going back a long time. But it's not tiptoe through the tulips, is it? No, we face problems. And so he says in chapter 5, rejoice in your tribulations. Oh, yeah, we are a freak to the world. We're supernatural people. Rejoice when you have trouble. <laughs> wow, who does that? Only supernatural people do that. Why? Because you, that your trouble is producing a perseverance, and your perseverance is producing character, and your character or maturity is producing hope. God brought me through last time. God will bring me through this time. God will bring me through every time. That's what happens when you grow and you have pain in your life. Evangelism, they had persecution, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Comfort. St. Corinthians, he said, God comforts you so you can comfort somebody else. Like I said, it's not just our pity party. It's about us ministering to somebody else. It's redemption. If anybody's ever had a time when you prayed and asked God to deliver you from the suffering, then guess who joins you? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Crickets in heaven. Crickets, no, is there any, is it no, no, I'm not delivering you. Why? Because there is a greater good that is going to come out of this. There's going to be a redemption. There's going to be a deliverance. There's going to be a greater good. And the reward comes in Revelation chapter 2. In one day, my friend, we got a future hope. We have a future hope right now, but that future hope is going to be one day realized when there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more death, no more curse. Amen. We're going to have no more devil and no more sin. Praise God. We have a reason to hope for the future. Hallelujah. Man, I'll tell you what, I feel like I had my Wheaties this morning. Breakfast of champions. But actually, we know there's a final evil, and that's the emotional evil. There is demonic evil, there's moral evil, there's natural evil. There is emotional evil. Because the devil sends a wo wounding spirits to wound you. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know, this is not patty cake time. The enemy's out to wound you. You know, it takes three soldiers that are healthy to care for one wounded soldier on the battlefield. And if he can just wound all of us, then all we do is we, we don't reach the, the harvest. We just keep taking care of each other's wounds. It's good to take care of each other's wounds, to weep with those that weep. But we have to understand the enemy is out to wound and destroy us all. Sorry to give you the good news today. At least I'm smiling. You see, when we look at emotional evil, we understand that this is really the twist. This is not just the knife. The knife is demonic evil. It's moral, natural evil. But the twist is the bitterness. Because the enemy wants to emotionally wound you so that you don't feel like being close to God again. You don't feel like you can trust him again. You don't feel like your life can have a good ending. You don't feel like you can get over this. 
These are all what the accuser does. Jesus said, he is a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. Look at these handsome guys. I mean, look at this, uh, Charles Darwin. What a handsome beard there. He would have been good on Duck Dynasty, right? Could have got a roll there. Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, a uh, guy that, the, that, that postulated the evolution theory, the great ends, and was an atheist. But was he an atheist cognitively? He was raised Baptist. How about that? <laughs> Yet, he lost a daughter at age 10, Anna, and Anna was the joy of his household, he said. And maybe, just maybe, the problem of evil of God not healing her contributed to his atheism. Bart Erdman, the next guy. Looking smart. Bart Erdman used to be a youth pastor, Christian youth pastor. Bart Erdman was trained at Wheaton College, Moody College, also Master of Divinity at Princeton. And then turned away from it all because of the problem of evil that he saw. Evil's personal, isn't it? It gets into our emotions. The next guy, I think this is Charles Hitchens. Now, this is Richard Dawkins, the guy that's in the white shirt. Richard Dawkins, one of the most foremost atheists today, Richard Dawkins was in an Anglican Christian boarding school and was memorizing scriptures, theology, just like all of the other boys. But then there was a Latin teacher that sexually abused him for years. Turned his confidence away toward people who were religious. He turned into be one of the greatest atheists. Last guy on there, Christopher Hitchens, was also in an Anglican boarding school. Father was an austere military man. He would identify more with his mother. And yet in that time that he was drawing strength from his mother in his Anglican church school, his mother ran off, left him for an Anglican priest that she had an affair with. Maybe, just maybe, emotional evil has a real twist to the heart. Maybe the problem of people being agnostic or atheist is not so much cognitive as it is emotional. Maybe. When we look at the psalmist's response to this, he, in the same chapter, comes down in verse 12, and he says, you know what, I know God is the rock. The revelation I have about God is my rock. I will not be moved. I know that God is all-powerful and is good. I also know from verse 8 that I can trust him. I have hope that I can trust him in all times to bring a greater good. Now, again, some things, folks, we can't even figure out how there could be good come out of it. I agree. There's some things that, like, how could you think you're reading good come out of that? You know, mutilations of children and war and all the various things that take place. Well, we don't know. We can't say all we do know is the principles of God, that God is good, and we know his promises that God is able to work all things together for good somehow. Even the Holocaust, six million Jews being annihilated, worked towards sympathy of them being created as a nation in 19, 1948. I'm not going to give you a pat answer that there's something good we can identify. No, I can't answer that. Only God can. But what I can say is that he knew that God and who he was was a rock. He knew that his hope was in God, that he could trust him at all times. And he also knew that God Loving kindness, love and kindness is who you are, he says in verse 12. Wow, wasn't this the same guy who was complaining for the first five verses of the chapter? How long am I going to wait? Verse 3, you're going to let these enemies keep on uh, giving me a beat down? I mean, how, how, what, I'm in silence here, just wondering what's going on here. And all this. And then he comes down and says, God, I can trust him, and God is loving. This is how you are not moved. This guy, Francis Damien, is on the left in the uh, 19th century. He's found out that the, found out that the uh, colony in uh, Molokai off the Hawaiian Islands, there was a colony of lepers that did not have a priest. So even though he could catch lepers, he went to be the priest. He went there to be the priest, and then after 12 years, he pulled back his shirt to the lepers and said, we lepers, because he had contracted leprosy and would eventually die from it as well. He had showed those lepers something that they knew that he had love because he entered into their suffering with them. So it is, there's a guy that's Francis uh, uh, 
Francis, I can't remember his last name, but Francis, he's a good guy. Francis was uh, someone who was a scientist who wrote the, uh, who helped discover the genome under President Clinton. He was on President Trump's um, uh, national health advisory boards and so forth, a great scientist who was an atheist. But this atheist was assigned to hospice. And in the hospice, this atheist noticed that the way that Christians died was different than the way non-Christians died. And he noticed that Christians had a lot of peace and sometimes even joy that was absent from those that didn't know God. And then one day, one of the hospice patients asked him, so as an atheist, how do you face death? And when he thought about it, he didn't know. And guess what? He became a Christian. Could it be, could it be that the way that we go through suffering, the way that we go through pain in life is a testimony to other people around us that are watching us to see how we respond as a Christian? And that maybe, just maybe, he would, you know, those people that died wouldn't know until they got to heaven that they helped bring him to Christ, and then his testimony would influence so many others to Christ. I'm here to tell you that when you can't make sense of it all, there's one that can, and then promises us that he's able <laughs> to work all things together for good. What we find is that Jesus entered into our suffering. What is what is, how do we know he loves us in suffering? How do we know he loves us in spite of the problem of evil in our life? How do we know that? How can we not be moved but be assured of that? Because we know that he entered into our suffering with us. Only Christianity has God that entered into their suffering. Everyone else has philosophies and everything, but only one, Christianity, is sent his son. God, God in the flesh came to actually enter into our suffering. God is not an abstract idea or force out there. God is a personal God who says that I am not only going to sympathize with you, but I'm going to come and actually suffer with you. When you read the Gospels, you read about Jesus cried everywhere. <laughs> he, at least three times in the Gospel, he was weeping. Six times says he had compassion. Compassion is he was moved from deep inside of himself over the suffering of other people. Jesus was showing us what God is like, that he came and entered into, and he wept over what had happened to the creation that he made to be good and live in paradise, and one day we'll restore to paradise, but right now he is weeping over our problems of evil. He has compassion. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace because he was already tempted and tried in every area like we are, and so because of that, we come boldly knowing that we have a simple pathetic high priest that didn't just theologically say, oh, I think I know. He came and experienced it. That's why in Revelation chapter 5, there's silence in heaven because there's a scroll that th th this is there that can't be opened because it's a scroll that redeems the, the, uh, the sin and the degradation and the destruction of the world. And only somebody worthy can open the scroll. So it doesn't give him a vision of being the lion at that point. It gives him the vision of being the lamb as if it it was slain. Friend, this is the picture. All the pictures and symbols of all the religions of the world. Islam has a crescent moon and a, and a star. And, and you got all these different... Well, what's the symbol of Christianity? It's a cross, folks. It's a cross. <laughs> it is showing that the biggest... Thing the devil levies against you, the cross, is what Jesus came to die on so he can redeem and take away the biggest trick in the devil's book to try to get you to turn away from God, and that is to redeem the evil. So when it says there was nobody and then they saw a lamb as if it had been slain, stand up, well, or, or be there and appear, guess what it meant? It meant that every premature death he experienced, every wound, every rejection, every sorrow, every kind of evil that is unjust, that he was the lamb slain, that he was appearing as the one who was able to redeem, the only one able to redeem all the pain, all the problems of evil, all the suffering. And that's why they said, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor. Power.
So Jesus says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will be with you. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. John, uh, Matthew 20, 28, 8, 28, 20 says that, uh, says that I am with you always. He didn't abandon you. Job thought he was abandoned. 38 chapters, he rambles on. His friends did a great job of being comforters until they opened their mouth. They were there for a whole week and said nothing. Because presence is the greatest present you can give someone else. And then after 38 chapters, God says, hey, just in case you're wondering, I've been listening. I've heard you, Job. Let me tell you, you may wonder if God's listening to you, but God is listening to you. Exodus 3 and 7, I have heard their cry, and I am coming down to deliver them. I'm here to tell you that because of our problem of evil, he entered into our, our problem so he could redeem it. And this is why we understand the presence of God is the, the presence of Jesus is the greatest prescription and the greatest evidence of his love for you. He didn't want you going this by yourself. He not only redeemed it and said, I'm just going to live far away up here in heaven. He said, no, I am going to send you my another comforter. Another paraclete who's going to stick beside you and walk with you through life and teach you to overcome just like I overcame. And when you overcome and see me, you will sit down on my throne with me because I've overcome and I've taught you to overcome and we will sit together and we will reign together for eternity and eternity because that is why I'm giving you my spirit to see you through. I've got to conclude. 12, 12. Psalm 16 then brings it to an end. What does the Lord say is our response? We know that he, the rock of who he is, is our, as a, the revelation rather of who he is is our rock. The hope of our trust is that we can trust him all times to bring a greater good. And then the love that he has toward us was evidenced in what he did to suffer with us. And now what he gives us to overcome in this life. David, who many times said this phrase 14 times, I shall not be moved, gave us the secret. Here in Psalm 16, if you read the title over it, it says a mictum, a mictum of David. A mictum is an interesting Hebrew word. Some interpret it as golden. Some interpret it as to cover. Collectively, they say that it means David's golden secret of handling the problem of evil. What was David's mictum, his golden secret of the problem of evil, handling it? It was the presence of God. As Pastor James comes to the piano, this is what he said in Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. I have set him at my right hand. Therefore, I shall not be moved. Verse 9, he talks about in verse 10, he said that, for I know he will not abandon my soul to hell. He's not going to let me live in this hell. He's not going to abandon my soul to hell. And I also know that in his presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures <laughs> forevermore. You see... Too many Christians get content to live without the presence of God. Too many times we get careless. David got careless at one phase of his life. And when he got careless with the presence of God, he got into sin with Bathsheba and a whole bunch of other stuff. Friend, I want to tell you that church is not a waste of your time. 
Your spiritual disciplines are not a waste of your time. Your faith is not a waste of your time. I'm here to tell you that when you set the Lord always before you and he's at my right hand, that means I can touch him. Amen. He's not like far away. Where did I leave Jesus? Did I leave him back in Jerusalem? No. He is like my right hand. He is right there near me. He's close to me. I keep him close, right? I keep him close and because I know the secret, the secret to handling crisis is that I set the Lord always before me, that I keep him at my right hand because I know that if I got him, he's not going to abandon me to hell. And I know that in his presence is the fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let me tell you, Paul said that in all my distress, my joy knew no limits. What is the joy? Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and 4, it's the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Friend, I'm not even talking about his deliverance. I'm talking about the joy of Jesus. You know, Jesus, he was a cool dude. You know, he went around all the time saying, be of good cheer. <laughs> hey, take that frown and turn it around. Come on now. He said, be of good cheer. Why? I've overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm going to tell you, this life is about learning to be like Jesus. Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, 16, as he is, so are we in this world. It's about learning to overcome. It's about learning to trust in God. It's about learning to practice the presence of the Spirit of God. Why was he praying for three hours in the Garden of Gethsemane before crucifixion? Because he knew it was the presence. I will always set the presence of God before me. I will keep him at my right hand because I know if he's with me and he won't abandon me, I've got to have Jesus in my life. I've got to have the Holy Spirit full inside of me. Come on, somebody. Somebody get hungry for God in this house. Somebody. Somebody. Oh. Oh. Let's all stand together, beloved. I'm going to ask the praise team to, to prepare the verse. He took what the enemy meant for evil and turned it for good. And then the course, I'm going to see a victory. Because when I started to work on this, the Holy Spirit said, you know what? The enemy is moving as well as I am. And some of my people are being moved by the enemy more than me. He says, I need you to tell them how they can not be moved. Tell them I love them. Tell them I'm with them. Tell them that they can believe in me as a rock of their faith. They can trust me at all times. Tell them that in my presence it's the secret of overcoming the devil and the problem of evil. So for those of you that are warring and you feel like you're in a warfare, those of you that need the healing of Christ, because I'm sure that the enemy has sent wounding spirits to wound you. I am positive about that. Understand, it just wasn't that person. Understand, it just wasn't that circumstance. Understand who's behind it all, the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness. And it's time that you laid the blame where the blame needs to be laid. And it's time that you forgave people who you thought were the course or were deserving your bitterness. It's time that you forgave and even some of you forgive God. It's time that you said what the enemy meant for evil. I declare today. Come on, believer. I declare today. What the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn around for good. <laughs> I declare that I am going to see a victory. <laughs> oh, yes. Come on now. I declare. Now. Woo. Faith, faith always has an action. So if you, if you believe this word, you're going to act differently. Some of you are going to pray. Some of you are going to come forward and join me in the altar and sing with this team and declare. What the enemy meant for evil, God is going to mean for good. Some of you are going to 
declare and praise him because I'm going to see a victory. You're going to get in the presence of God. It's David's secret. I will set the Lord always before him. Some of you are going to decide that you're going to ramp up your faith. When you leave here this week, you're going to have a greater prayer time and prayer and praise for life than you've ever had before. People don't know this, but I've got a, I've got a, I'm old, man. I'm as old as dirt. I got a CD player that has a CD that is old as the hills, but it's got this worship music on that always gets me in the presence of God. And that's my go-to worship time. I tell you what, when I, when I need to, I get that out and I put that on. Why? Because I know I need to set the Lord before me. I know I need to get in the presence of God. Come on now. And God wants you to want that. He wants you to feel that. He wants you to say, oh, yes, I'm coming. I want to get in the presence of God. So I want you to step out and join me if you're in spiritual warfare. I want you to step out and join me right now. Come on, don't be afraid. You, you could be about something else. Sean, you guys, come on up right now. Come on out. Some of you need to come out and step out of your seat. Because when you step out, it's an action. And when you step out with an action, you release faith. And when you release faith, you release God to do something in your life. So I want you to step out like you have right now and get in here. And I want you to begin to practice the presence of God. And while, if you're standing there, do the same thing. I want you to begin to declare that what the enemy meant for evil, God's going to mean for good. And I'm going to see a victory. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to do that, beloved? You're not going to leave here like you came in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, if you'll do that, you're not going to leave here. Okay, you ready, Pastor James? Let's do it right now. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Come on now, start saying it. And you turn it for good. Come on now, start saying it. You turn it for good. 